Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second part of this uh, total four-part webinar series. Uh, today, we will focus on uh, talking about JEDI data. JEDI is a LIDAR sensor on the International Space Station, and we'll have a demo on how to access and um, analyze this data. Now, before we start, I wanted to uh, remind you of uh, some of the kind of key things that we covered last time. So we went through the fundamentals of LIDAR. We discussed different types of LIDAR systems, discrete, uh, full waveform, photon counting type of LIDAR systems. Then we went into specifically ISAT-2, which is a photon counting LIDAR. And we have had a great presentation from Amy Neunschwander about the use of ISAT-2 for vegetation studies. And then we ended that session with a demo by Nick Kotlinski on how to access ISAT-2 data and how to analyze the data. So today, uh, JEDI um, will we'll cover more or less the, the same format in terms of um, access of the data and analysis of the data. And I just wanted to remind you, JEDI is a full waveform LIDAR data, uh, LIDAR data set. So it is uh, different from ISAT-2. And the discussion today will discuss some of those uh, the specific information content about JEDI. Uh, with us today, we have two JEDI science team members, Dr. John David Armstrong, from University of Maryland, and Dr. Michelle Hofton from University of Maryland as well. And they will be here to answer your questions um, at the end uh, when we start the Q&A period. So let's just get started right now with uh, Cole Kriebel, who's a uh, remote sensing data scientist at the LPDAC, that's the Data Archive Center that houses all of the JEDI data. Hello everyone, my name is Cole Crable and I'm a data scientist working as a contractor to NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center or LPDAC. Today I'll be going through some resources that we provide for getting started with accessing, processing, and visualizing JEDI L1B L2A and L2B LiDAR data. Okay, so I'm going to start today by giving you some background information on the LPDAC, the JEDI mission, and the JEDI LiDAR products archived and distribu distributed by the LPDAC. After that, I'm going to set up an example use case for how you might use JEDI data, and then I'll jump into some live demos and walkthroughs of the various JEDI data access, processing, and visualization resources that are available from the LPDAC. Once I have shown you how to find, access, and process JEDI data, I'll give a quick tutorial for how you can start mapping your JEDI outputs in 3D using QGIS. After that, I will provide a live demo of how to extract JEDI version 2 data in Earth Data Search, which because of the updated metadata and suborbitized granules, we're able to spatially query those files and subset directly in Earth Data Search once those become publicly available. After that, I'll briefly cover our plans to add JEDI into Appears, and lastly show you where you can access our e-learning materials. So NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC, is located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, at the USGS Aero Center, which some of you likely recognize is also being the home of the Landsat Archive. We are one of the NASA EOS decks, focusing primarily on archiving, distributing, in supporting NASA's land remote sensing data products. In addition to archiving and distributing NASA's land remote sensing data products, we also provide services and support in order to advance the access, understanding, and use of our data for large and diverse user communities, which is what I hope to accomplish here today. And so here you can see some of the other missions we support, including MODIS, ASTER, VIRS, Ecostress, and HLS, but today we're going to focus on JEDI LiDAR data. So JEDI, or the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, is a full waveform LiDAR instrument that produces detailed observations of the three-dimensional structure of the Earth's surface. 
The goal of the mission is to characterize ecosystem structure and dynamics to enable radically improved quantification and understanding of Earth's carbon cycle and biodiversity. JEDI was launched on December 5th, 2018, and is attached to the International Space Station, or ISS. JEDI is likely to remain on orbit through September 2022 and could potentially be extended into 2023. The JEDI instrument consists of three lasers. So there are two full power lasers and one laser that is split into two beams, producing a total of four beams. From there, each beam is dithered, producing a total of eight beam ground transects, resulting in four full power beam tracks and four coverage beam tracks. The four full power beam transects may be better suited for penetrating dense canopies. Each JEDI beam track consists of roughly 25 meter diameter footprint samples spaced every 60 meters along track, with JEDI beam transects spaced approximately 600 meters apart in the cross track direction for a total cross track width of around 4.2 kilometers. Being on the ISS, JEDI orbits the Earth 16 times a day between roughly 52 degrees north and south latitudes, but due to the small swath width, JEDI will only ever cover a sample of Earth's surface and is reliant on the orbit of the ISS to acquire new data over new locations. JEDI collects data both during the day and at night and actually has slightly better data quality at night due to the lack of solar background noise. JEDI does require cloud-free acquisitions in order to successfully retrieve accurate observations of the Earth's surface. JEDI captures full waveform observations that are then used to generate forest canopy height, canopy vertical structure, and surface elevation that can advance our ability to characterize carbon and water cycle processes, biodiversity, and habitat. And then here you can see the data are provided in HDF5 file format. There are three publicly available JEDI products that are archived and distributed by the LPDAC. These are currently all version one products. However, version two products are on the way and hopefully will be made publicly available in the near future. So starting with the level one data, we have the level one B geolocated waveform product, which provides geolocated full waveforms and supporting data sets for each laser shot for all eight JEDI beam transects. Datasets in this product include the geolocated full waveforms, geolocation parameters, and geophysical corrections. From there, we have the JEDI Level 2A Elevation and Height Metrics product, which takes the waveform data and interprets it into meaningful metrics, including ground elevation, canopy top height, relative return energy metrics that describe the canopy vertical structure, and other interpreted products from the return waveforms. And then lastly, there is the JEDI L2B canopy cover and vertical profile metrics data, which is the product we'll focus on mainly for today. The purpose of the L2B product is to extract biophysical metrics from each JEDI waveform based on the directional gap probability profile. Metrics include canopy cover, plant area index or PAI, plant area volume density or PAVD, and foliage height diversity or FHD. And then as I mentioned, uh, today we'll be looking at version one of these products, but do keep an eye out for version two, where the data will be split into suborbit granules, which will be nice because it will lead to smaller file sizes that you need to download. And also there is improved geolocation accuracy at around 11 meters for version two, compared with around 25 meters for version one. And then lastly, I did just wanna clarify that the LPDAC only archives and distributes the level 1B, level 2A, and level 2B footprint level products. The level 3 gridded canopy height metrics products and level 4 biomass products will be made available from NASA's Oak Ridge National Laboratory DAC in the near future. Okay, so for today, we are going to pretend that we work for the National Park Service in Redwood National Park in Northern California. Now the National Park Service is looking to use JEDI to create a 3D map of elevation and canopy top height over the park using the 18 months of version one data that's currently available. They're doing this to create a baseline 3D map of canopy height and elevation throughout the park. This could be useful in case of a natural disaster such as a forest fire or flooding or a landslide, but they would want to know what the forest and landscape looked like before and after the disaster. 
The NPS plans to find intersecting JEDI data for the region of interest using the JEDI Finder web service, then use the links returned from JEDI Finder to download the data, subset and process the files using the JEDI subsetter data prep script, and ultimately visualize the data in 3D using QGIS. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears and go through some live walkthroughs to show you all where you can find resources for getting started with JEDI data. Uh, you can follow along if you'd like, but I'm gonna go through things fairly quickly here. So feel free to just watch me as I go through the various walkthroughs as well. Okay, so let's get started by visiting the LPDX website. As you can see the link for here, this is located at lpdac.usgs.gov. Here is our homepage for the LPDAC website. I'm gonna go ahead and direct your attention to this data tab. And then we're gonna move over here to get started with data. From here, we're gonna go ahead and click on collection overview. So the collection overview page on our website will give you a little background information on all of the missions that we support, including MODIS, Aster, Veers, EcoStress, and HLS, but today we're focused on JEDI, so let's take a look at JEDI. Again, here you can see some information. Uh, there's also some great information stored in our JEDI overview page, including things like file naming conventions that I find very useful, but today we're going to go ahead and click on JEDI products table. So this will pull up our search data catalog. It's been filtered down to the JEDI products that we support, and in particular now we're going to Go ahead and take a look at the L2B canopy cover and vertical profile metrics data. So I click into that. This will take us to the DOI product landing page for JEDI L2B. You can think of this as kind of like the home page for the JEDI L2B product. This will include useful information such as a description of the product, uh, characteristics including collection and granule level metadata, um, a nice table to view all the different layers included in the L2B product and some of their metadata characteristics, as well as any information about the quality of the product and any known issues. So if I scroll back up now, I wanted to show you guys uh, the buttons located at the top here. So if I go ahead and start with citation, this will take you to our citation generator where you just need to select a citation style. I'm gonna go ahead and select APA, and boom, just in seconds, you can copy a citation that will give you the correct data set citation if you choose to use the JEDI L2B product in your research. We really wanna encourage our users to start using these JEDI um, data set citations if you haven't already. Um, it's just good science. It helps the JEDI science team see how their data are being used, and it actually helps other users see how the data are being used, which I'll show you here in a second. Okay, next button, I wanna go over access data. This will bring up a list of tools that are available from the LPDAC in order to access JEDI data. In particular, if you're the type of person that just wants access to directly where the data reside on the data pool, you can click on this link here on the right and that will take you to exactly where all the JEDI L2B data are actually stored. Now today, we're gonna to go ahead and take a look at NASA's Earth Data Search. Um, the JEDI subsetter data prep script, and the JEDI finder web service. So we'll be looking at those in a second here. Okay, next I wanna show you guys the using the data button here. This will include a dropdown for any e-learning materials that apply to the JEDI L2B product. Here we have a Jupyter Notebook tutorial that's called Getting Started with JEDI L2B Data in Python, um, which helps you start interacting with JEDI data um, in a in a more interactive fashion using a Jupyter Notebook in Python. And then we also previously recorded a JEDI, JEDI NASA Earth Data webinar, um, and there's a link provided to that as well, so you can watch that recording on YouTube. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to show you all is this publications list. As I mentioned, if you do use JEDI L2B data and you include a data set citation in your publication, we will then be able to find that once it's published and we'll add it to our public publications table on our website, and then it'll be linked to here so that other users can see how you use JEDI L2B data. And then last but certainly not least, we have our documentation tab, includes PDFs of useful information such as ATBDs, user guides, uh, data dictionaries, and then also this JEDI spatial querying and subsetting quick guide, 
which I kind of want to draw your guys' attention to now. Okay, so we created the JEDI Spatial Querying and Subsetting Quick Guide to provide instructions on how to find granules for a region of interest um, or do spatial querying, and then also how to perform spatial and layer subsetting of JEDI data accessed either from the LPDAC data pool directly or using NASA's Earth Data Search. So I'm going to go ahead and open up that quick guide. So here we can see what that looks like. Now again, the main motiva motivating factor why we created this quick guide is that with the JEDI version one data, uh, we were unable to actually provide spatial querying within Earth Data Search Client itself, meaning that it could be difficult to find the JEDI full orbits that intersect your region of interest. And due to the large file size, you don't want to download all of the data and then um, find where which uh, orbits intersect your region of interest. So in order to alleviate some of those data access issues that we were experiencing, we created this quick guide to show you two different workflows for how to get started, finding the correct JEDI data for your region of interest, downloading it, subsetting it, and then um, going on with your analysis. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is find the granules um, for our region of interest, right? So this idea of spatial querying. So for that, we created the JEDI Finder web service, which is a simple web service where you provide the product you're interested in. Here, you can see the list um, in a simple bounding box, and it's gonna return the JEDI full orbit granules that intersect your region of interest. So I go ahead and click on that link. It'll open up the JEDI Finder. Now, again, I'm gonna show this here and demo it in the actual web browser. Um, but note that you can actually access this programmatically using either the command line or Python or R or whichever your favorite um, programming language is. Okay, so I'm gonna just go ahead and click on the example, show you guys what this looks like. Okay, so while that's loading, you can see here, so we added product equals Jedi L1B in bounding box, in upper left latitude, upper left longitude, lower right latitude, lower right longitude format. Okay, so now if I go back here, you can see it has loaded a list of all of the JEDI full orbit granules that intersect this region of interest. By default, it's returned as JSON. However, if I go up into the link here and add and output equals HTML, and then just to show you guys, if you were interested in, let's say, the Jedi L2B product, hit enter there. Um, and one thing I did want to note here, too, is you will need to be a little patient. It may take you know, a few seconds to load these queries. Um, it's trying to find spatial intersections on thousands of very complex Jedi full orbit footprints. So just be patient as it's loading. And so the nice thing here with the HTML formatted output is that um, the links are actually hyperlinked. So you could then click and download the JEDI data for your region of interest directly in your web browser if you prefer to do that. Okay, so that is the JEDI Finder. Now I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint here. Okay, so now we've done our JEDI spatial query and successfully found the data intersecting our region of interest. Now there are two different workflows available for subsetting the data. I will show you both options today, but before I do that, I did want to walk through a comparison to help you understand which subsetting tool is right for your workflow when working with the JEDI version one data. So here you can kind of work through the comparison table, but in general, I would recommend using the JEDI subsetter data prep script if you are comfortable working with Python in the command line, are able to download the large full JEDI orbits, are looking to subset JEDI files by a shapefile or GeoJSON region of interest, and are looking for the subset output files to be exported as GeoJSON files that can be imported and visualized directly in your GIS or remote sensing software of choice, which we'll show today. Now, on the other hand, I would recommend using the Earth Data Search subsetting services. If you're looking for GUI-based subsetting, don't want to download full JEDI orbits before you get started, and are looking for output files in HDF5 format. Now, if you prefer to not download full JEDI orbits, but you want your outputs as GeoJSON, I did want to mention that you can use the JEDI subsetter data prep script 
to convert the Earth Data Search client subsetting outputs from HDF5 to GeoJSON files. Also, as I will demo here soon, if you are working with the JEDI version 2 data in the future, it's probably preferable to simply use the Earth Data Search subsetting services and then optionally use the data prep script to convert to GeoJSON if that is your desired output file format. Okay, so let's go back to the quick guide. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down to the subsetting section. So again, there's two different workflows. We're gonna take a look at both of them today. They both start by using the Jedi Finder web service so that you can find the Jedi granules over your region of interest. And now we wanna actually do some spatial and band or layer subsetting. So the first workflow I'm gonna show you guys um, is by downloading the data directly which you can see there are instructions for here, and then using a data prep script, a Python script to actually process the data. Okay, so we found a list of links to the JEDI data we'd like to download. I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but I did just wanna mention that there are a host of different um, e-learning materials that we've made available to show you different options for how to bulk download those JEDI granules, including using the DAC to disk tool, um, we have a set of instructions on using command line utilities like wget or curl. And then also we provided um, data prep scripts for in both R and Python to um, take the list of files from the Jedi Finder web service, feed it into one of these scripts, and it will bulk download those files um, to your local operating system. I'm not going to go through a demo of that today, just in the interest of time. But so today we're gonna to assume that we went through and we downloaded a couple of JEDI granules so that I can show you the next part, which is to do the actual subsetting. So here you can see in step B, we need to perform our spatial uh, and layer subsetting. And the first workflow I'm gonna show here is the JEDI spatial and band or layer subsetting and export to GeoJSON data prep script, also known as JEDI subsetter. Um, so this is a command line executable Python script that will allow you to spatially subset the JEDI files you downloaded um, beforehand by submitting either a GeoJSON or a shapefile or a simple bounding box region of interest. And then we, um, by default, return a subsetted uh, list of layers from each of the JEDI products um, that you've downloaded, but you can always add additional layers if we didn't include one that you need as well. And then again, the script's going to clip and ship those uh, data into GeoJSON files that you could then easily load into your GIS or remote sensing software of choice. So let's go ahead and click on this here and show you what that looks like. This will take you to the LPDAC data user resources Bitbucket repository. Uh, this is where we host all of the LPDAC's e-learning materials that are code based. Um, you can see here, now what I, I wanna say here is Yes, you will have to actually download a Python script and set up a compatible Python environment in order to execute the JEDI subsetter. Um, but if you're not familiar with Python, um, I don't want to frighten anyone here. It's pretty simple to get started. And one thing that we really try and do a good job of is giving step-by-step -step instructions for exactly how to execute everything. So you can see here, you'll need to download the JEDI subsetter um, Python script. We go through step-by-step -step instructions for how to set up a compatible Python environment. And then again, with how to actually execute the script for exactly what you're looking for. So definitely read through the readme before you get started and we'll give you instructions for how to set everything up. Okay, so we're gonna assume here that I have set up a compatible Python environment. I've downloaded the data prep script. Now you're gonna to need to open up your um, favorite command line interface. Um, if you're using Mac or Linux, this could be terminal or it could be command prompt in Windows. Here I'm using Commander, this is my um, favorite command line interface. Um, and so you can see here, I have navigated to the directory that I'd like to um, execute the script in and I've downloaded the script to. I've set up um, this Jedi Python environment and activated it. And then you can probably see here, I've ran this previously. So I'm gonna go ahead and just hit the up arrow here to pull that command back up. You can see you just call Python, jedi subsetter.py, 
and then dash dash dir, and that dir is going to be the directory containing the Jedi full orbit granules that you've downloaded. And then dash dash ROI, which here you can see I'm going to use a GeoJSON over our Redwood National Park boundaries. Um, this also could be a shape file or a simple bounding box. And then there are additional commands, um, dash dash SDS, if you need to add any additional layers that are, were not included um, in the default and dash dash beams if you just like to subset and export certain Jedi beam transects. Okay, so I go ahead and hit enter there. So while that starts processing, you should start to see some feedback letting you know that it's going to bulk process through all of the Jedi files that it found. Here you can see it found three Jedi files in my directory. Um, one thing here I'll mention too is you will again need to be patient. Uh, these are very large and complex files, including millions of shots. Um, and so here, even for a smaller region of interest like Redwood National Park, um, it may take a few minutes to process these files. Now, again, if you ask for like the entire state of California, obviously um, it will take even longer. And it's particularly um, writing that uh, large chunk of JEDI data back as a GeoJSON file. Um, may take um, a few minutes in order to complete. Okay, so we're not going to wait for that. I'll show you guys what the previous run outputs looked like. So now I'm going to go ahead and open up QGIS. Okay, so just to familiarize everyone here, I've loaded QGIS. I've added a Google satellite base map. Here we have the Pacific Ocean on the left, Northern California on the right. And then in Cyan are the actual park boundaries for Redwood National Park. Um, a couple other layers that I've included here, including a 2020 NAEP imagery. Um, so NAEP is a um, optical um, airborne um, data set. And I downloaded that from the USGS Earth Explorer. That's not an LPDAC data set, but it is available through USGS Earth Explorer. But it's high resolution aerial photography um, that makes it really nice and easy to see um, the landscape you know in higher detail than some of our other remote sensing data sets and then below that one we actually have the nasa dem which is kind of an improved version of srtm and that i did extract through appears which i'll show you guys um, a little bit about appears later on today and that is publicly available from the lpdac okay so now we can go ahead and find our outputs Okay, so here you can see I had three JEDI files and then I have three resulting output uh, GeoJSON files. I'm going to take the JEDI L2B file and drag and drop it directly into QGIS. And here you can see what that looks like. Um, just quickly, I'm going to change the color. It might be a little easier to see. Let's make everything orange. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the GeoJSON is going to be. Um, a point vector file. You can see these points here. So each Jedi shot is going to be an individual point. And then if we count across here, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Jedi beam transects um, in the across track direction. And so those are going to be spaced approximately 600 meters apart, as I mentioned. And then each Jedi shot is roughly 60 meters apart. And the footprint diameter is roughly 25 meters for each shot. Okay, so the first thing that I want to show you all is if I go ahead and right click in open attribute table, just wanted to show you how the data are structured before we get started with visualizing them. So here you can see if I open the attribute table, each row is going to be a single JEDI shot or um, a single observation that's derived from, from one waveform and then created into the L2B metrics. So I can tell you this first shot that we have here is shot number ending in 7207. I can see the lat long location. I know that it came from beam 0000. And then as you move on down the line, um, one thing I did want to mention are for any data sets that uh, have a vertical uh, profile or a vertical step, which is this Z parameter here, which is five meters. Uh, we actually split that out into a specific column for the um, variable at each height. 
So here you can see the cover at Z, which is five meters times two equals 10, is 0 0.0266 for this specific shot. Okay, as I keep moving across, again, each column here is going to be one of the JEDI data sets. Now I wanna focus in here on the L2B quality flag. Um, so the L2B quality flag is kind of a nice, uh, like yes, no, is this good quality shot? Um, it means that a specific shot has gone through uh, a series of quality indicators that will either define it as poor quality or uh, good quality. And so a value of zero means that the shot was deemed to have uh, poor or lesser quality. And so if I actually just filter by clicking on the column header heading there, I can see all of the shots that were deemed poor quality, whereas a quality value of one indicates that the shot met the requirements um, to be considered a good quality shot. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and then select all of the poor quality shots and show you all just how to do some really quick quality filtering. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit this pencil to toggle editing mode. I'm gonna hit the red delete selected features button. Go ahead and save my edits and then toggle editing. And now you can see in just a few seconds, we've already quality filtered our Jedi uh, orbit. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the attribute table there. So the next thing that I wanted to mention is that um, in a previous webinar that I showed on our website, we did some 2D visualization um, where we looked at canopy top height um, in two dimensions. So if that's what you're interested in, definitely check back on that webinar. But today we're gonna to look at everything in three dimensions or 3D. So before I get started, I'm now just going to turn off the Google satellite and the NAPE imagery before I forget. And now I'm gonna direct your attention up here to plugins and then manage and install plugins. So today we're gonna to be using the QGIS 23JS uh, plugin. Uh, I really like this plugin, particularly for plotting vector data in 3D. Um, so I can show you all how that works today. Now you can see here, I've already installed it, but if you're um, just starting to use this plugin, You'll just search for it up top here and then click install plugin. It should be quick and easy to get um, that installed. Okay, I'm gonna exit out of that. Um, so now I'm gonna go here to the web menu toolbar and then hit QGIS to 3GIS and load the exporter. So this will pull up like a three dimensional map view of our data. Um, here you can start to see if you click like with your mouse, we're on a three dimensional plane here. I start zooming in, we can start to see the data that's loaded. Um, it should automatically detect if you have a, a digital elevation model loaded, otherwise you can add that here. So here you can see we're using the NASA DEM as our digital elevation model. First thing I wanted to show you guys is how to set this up. So I'm gonna double click on this to open the layer properties. Um, so here I like to up the resampling level as high as I can. And then resolution, same thing, get the resolution as high as possible. And then I also really like having a transparent background. So you can check that box there. You can see I've already got those things loaded. And so now we can start playing around and really starting to gain some understanding towards um, what the elevation and topography of our national park looks like. Um, just to orient everyone. So in here in blue, this is um, anything at sea level, the ocean. And then there's kind of this river valley meandering through and dissecting our region of interest and then higher elevation as we move um, further inland into California. Okay, so one thing that I always like to point out too is here you can see this black north arrow. Um, for me, when I start working in 3D, it's really easy to get um, mixed up as you aren't always working in a north up fashion. So I can just show you guys here, if you go to scene and then decorations, you can go ahead and add a north arrow. So here we can see we're looking out from over the ocean kind of um, to the southeast as we move further inland. Okay, so the next thing I wanna show you guys is how to actually add the JEDI data. I'm gonna go ahead and check the box there. And here you can see it adds these, um, to me they look almost like orange tennis balls. But so we can go ahead and double click on layer properties here. Um, now as far as object type, I like using the cone because I think it looks like little Christmas trees, which makes it easier for me to visualize um, canopy top height in terms of uh, the elevation of the trees. The Z coordinate, 
coordinate, we want to go ahead and snap this relative to the NASA DEM elevation. And then here under radius, I always like to put in 25 here, you know, indicating the 25 meter footprint diameter of uh, each jet I shot. And then expression here for height, we're going to actually add RH100 divided by 100. Now, the reason why we add this expression instead of just RH100 is that in the L2B product, RH100 or canopy top height is stored in centimeters. So here we're dividing by 100 to get back to meters, which are the units that are used in our 3D map. Okay, so we can go ahead and hit OK there. And now it should start to load our Jedi canopy top height. And another um, neat feature here is if you press control while you move, it will stop you from moving on that third axis. It's, uh, uh, it's really easy to get kind of flipped around. Um, so just keep that in mind. But here we can start to see areas where there's low canopy height, not surprisingly over the river valley, and areas where there's high canopy height, you know, as we move forward into the hills. Um, so you can start playing around there and see the, the vertical structure from the JEDI data. Okay, so now, lastly, I want to go back and load the NAPE imagery back in. Um, so again, this is high resolution aerial photography. It's available from the USGS Earth Explorer. I think it's captured every uh, one to two years over most of the continental US. Um, but it, since it is very high resolution, this uh, TIFF here is actually around 11 gigabytes. It will take a little bit to load. All right, and here we can see that uh, that data has loaded. And now we can really start to gain some understanding um, into our region of interest and see as we move further inland, the topography, some high relief, some bigger hills, and um, confirmed from the aerial photography, we're seeing these uh, large redwood tree canopies. Now, I really wanted to focus in here on this particular area. So we have the, the river valley we can see here. We have, um, Kind of over the high relief terrain um, as you move up the river valley seeing really tall canopy heights um, retrieved from jedi and then as we hit this ridge line um, i'm not sure if this is a different type of forest or um, maybe a younger redwood stand but it's really incredible to see how we go from really tall rh100 or canopy top height and then lowering down over this other vegetation type i just think that's fascinating what we can see in the third dimension using JEDI data. Um, and then in the context of natural disasters, you could use this, save it off as a, kind of a baseline, um, three-dimensional map of the national park. Um, as you could imagine, there could be a flooding event over in this river or something like a forest fire or even a landslide where we would then be able to go back and reconstruct what the 3D structure of our national park and our forest looked like before and then again do after that event has occurred. All right, so that's a crash course in getting started with three-dimensional mapping of JEDI data and QGIS. Next thing I'm going to do here is quickly move back to the quick guide. Okay, so that's our first workflow. Again, it's a little bit more manual, a little bit more hands-on. Now, the second workflow I'm going to show here is using NASA's Earth Data Search Client. Um, in particular here, I want to stress that I'm going to show what the uh, JEDI version two data are going to look like, what that workflow will look like using NASA's Earth Data Search, because there's some big improvements on the way that will allow us to do spatial querying of JEDI data of the suborbit granules for version two, which will allow you to then go through, find the JEDI data and actually process um, and clip it to your region of interest all in the same application, which would be really great for users. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to my web browser here. And so you're gonna to wanna to look for search.earthdata.nasa.gov, um, but I'm gonna show you guys, again, this is just a, a demo from a test environment on a non-public data set. So we have some example version two data available that I can show you guys here. Okay, so this is NASA's Earth Data Search Client. Um, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's really the search portal for all of NASA EOS disk data holdings, not just LPDAC, not just JEDI, but
But today, I'm going to focus very specifically on how to access JEDI data and um, look at the subsetting services that will be available with version 2. And also, I did want to mention for any of you that are um, interested in using ISAT2 data, uh, the workflow of using these subsetting services for ISAT2 data is very similar as well. Okay, so we go ahead and type in JEDI in the search bar. Um, I should probably mention you will need a NASA Earth Data Login um, account in order to access JEDI data, so definitely go ahead and get uh, signed up for one. It's really quick and simple and obviously free to get signed up, but you will need to log in in order to access those data. Okay, so I search for JEDI. This first product that comes up here is the L2A uh, Elevation and Height Metrics data, version 2 again. Again, these aren't publicly available, but will be in the near future. I'm going to go ahead and click into that product. And then we're going to pretend today that we uh, want JEDI data over the country of Kenya. So let's go ahead over here, hit that box, and let's draw a bounding box over Kenya. And what you'll start to see here in these green lines are that it's going to actually find um, the spatial intersection of JEDI suborbit granules that intersect our region of interest, which is great news and big improvement for version two. If I zoom out here a little bit, you can kind of see how those um, granules are being split up. So here to here, you can see there's two different suborbits, and then here to here, two different suborbits. Um, so already that in itself will lead to follow, uh, smaller file sizes, um, but they, they will still be pretty big files. Um, but we've got uh, the JEDI EGI subsetting services for that. But what you can see here is that we can go ahead and click download all in this green button here. And then here um, we're going to go ahead and demo the uh, ESI subsetting services. So I go ahead and hit edit options. Then we're going to go ahead and check customize ESI. And then if you scroll down, there's an option here for spatial subsetting. So I'm going to go ahead and click to enable that. And what's really nice here is that it will load the bounding box coordinates from the shape that I drew directly in the map. And then if I keep scrolling down, we also can do band or layer subsetting. So here I should kind of explain the way that the JEDI data are stored um, in this hierarchical data format, HDF5 is that there is a main group for each beam transect. And then under that, which you can see here, if I open up this um, directory symbol, are all of the different data sets that were collected by this specific beam. And so you can see if you open a different beam, it has the same data sets, but collected by a different one of the other eight different beams. So if you wanted to, you could start um, selecting and deselecting specific beams or specific layers within beams that you're interested in. Let's say that I need the beam data set, so I check that on. Once you're satisfied with the different layers that you've selected, go ahead and hit Done, and then Download Data. So this is going to submit a request to those JEDI EGI subsetting services. They're going to actually take the source data and clip it to your region of interest and um, subset down to the layers that you've requested, and they're going to keep it in the native uh, format, the HDF5 format of the source data. So you could then, if you did want to um, convert to GeoJSON, you could then run those outputs through the JEDI subsetter data prep script in order to export to GeoJSON. Um, I did want to mention here, this is an asynchronous request, meaning that you do submit a request, and then um, it does not come up automatically, but you'll receive an email notification notifying you once that request has been completed and processed, and that will include links to download the HDF5 files that you've selected. All right, so that is what the workflow will look like for using JEDI version 2 data in Earth Data Search Client. Okay, so one other thing that will be new with JEDI version 2 is that we are working on integrating the L1B, L2A, and L2B JEDI version 2 data into a peers. For those that aren't familiar, APPEARS is the application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples. Uh, it's an easy-to-use web application for accessing, processing, and visualizing geospatial data products, including other collections that you may be familiar with, such as MODIS, VIRS, EcoStress, Landsat ARD, and a few different digital elevation models. 
We are planning to offer JEDI as area samples, meaning that you would define your region of interest. Here I've drawn a polygon over the Black Hills of South Dakota, and then select the time period of interest uh, that you're interested in and the specific JEDI product or products you'd like to extract. Uh, we do plan to offer different JEDI groupings, so you could select either all of the JEDI layers or layers specific to a theme like digital elevation mapping or vegetation mapping, and you can subset by specific beams as well. You'll be able to either leave JEDI in simple geographic coordinate reference system or reproject to a different output projection. Uh, Peers will ex export JEDI data in NetCDF4 file format with suborbits crossing your region of interest merged into a single NetCDF4 file. For certain layers, such as the JEDI-derived elevation shown here, we will also offer box plot time series. And for categorical variables and quality layers, we will show stack bar charts representing the distribution of values and what those values actually mean. And then like with any appears request, your outputs will include summary statistics in CSV format and the output files in NetCDF4 format. Um, so stay tuned once JEDI version 2 is released. We'll hopefully have those data in appears shortly after. And then the last thing I wanted to show you all today, again, was our e-learning pages. Um, so all of our e-learning materials for JEDI can be found at this link provided. These include things like uh, the past JEDI webinar recording that I've mentioned, um, and then also uh, the tutorial series. So we created a getting started with JEDI L1B, L2A, and L2B Python um, in Python Jupyter Notebook tutorial series, um, which you can use to explore how to start working with JEDI data in Python, kind of in a more hands-on and interactive fashion. Okay, and then I'm gonna end today with our contact slide. Um, first thing I wanted to point out here is the listserv at the bottom. Uh, if you want to be the first to know when JEDI version 2 is released, when it's added to appears, and if and when we start working on any other JEDI e-learning materials, please subscribe to that listserv. Uh, also, if you have any questions about JEDI as you start working with the data, particularly less uh, data access type of questions and more of the science-based questions, um, do feel free to post them to the NASA Earth Data Forum. There are probably others who have the same or similar questions. And we've actually set up some of the JEDI science team members with accounts so that they can answer your tough JEDI questions there as well. Thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you very much, Cole, for your presentation. And now before opening up our Q&A session, I'd like to introduce the two JEDI science team members that I mentioned at the beginning. and perhaps. Um, they can uh, say a little bit about themselves. So I'll let uh, John David Armstrong, if you wanna uh, introduce yourself to the group, please. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, sh my name is yeah, John Armstrong. I'm based at the University of Maryland where I'm an associate research professor working on the Jedi science team um, and specifically working on calibration and validation activities related to the Jedi height, cover, and above ground biomass products. Um, that's, I'm also a member of the competed Jedi science team, uh, where we're looking at uh, enhanced calibration and validation and improved estimation of cover from Jedi, particularly in shrubland and woodland ecosystems globally. Great. Thank you Thanks, very Erica. much. Thank you, John. And uh, Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, um, my name's uh, Michelle Hofton. I'm also at the University of Maryland in, in College Park. And um, I am in charge of um, developing the algorithms for detecting the ground and canopy height measurements from the laser waveforms. Um, and um, I'm also the... Um, uh, the science lead for the Elvis system, which is the um, airborne emulator for JEDI. And um, so we, we're taking a lot of the lessons that we've learned in the airborne environment and, in, and applying that to JEDI. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you both for being here. Uh, so let's start with the questions that we've been compiling. We're going to post those. We've uh, actually assembled those questions in a Google Doc that will appear here on your screen. Here you go. And so what we'll do is we'll work these questions from the top down. We'll try to get to every question you've posted. 
but this document is going to go online. So if we don't get to a question, uh, you can check at a later time because we'll make sure we respond to all the questions posted. So let's start with uh, question number one. Uh, does the compatible Python for JEDI data have to be Python version 3.7, or could it be the last version, Python 3.9.2? So I'll let uh, Cole or respond to this. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, okay. So I've only tested the JEDI subsetter Python script in Python version 3.7. However, you should be able to use Python 3.9.2 as well, um, as long as that version is supported by all of the Python packages that we use in the script. Um, but I would still recommend to use the suggested Python environment that I showed in the demo, um, which can be found in the README, um, which will instruct you on how to set up a compatible Python environment. Great, thank you. All right, question number two. Can JEDI be used to extract canopy height of mangroves? Has it been done before? Uh, either John or Michelle? Uh, yes, it has been. Uh, JEDI does measure the height of vegetation above the surface. However, inundation will impact the estimation of that canopy height. Um, Elvis that Michelle just mentioned before has has targeted mangrove ecosystems, particularly in Gabon, for validation of JEDI products in this environment. Um, and that work is is um, underway right now. Um, Dr. Lola Patoimbo at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is also a good point of contact for the use of JEDI data in mangroves. Great, thank you. Uh, question number three, very specific question related to Elvis data. So uh, we've used Elvis and JEDI L2A product at the footprint level in Lope Gabon, and there's a discrepancy, significant one, between Elvis relative heights 100 and JEDI RH 100 in dense forests taller than 35 meters. Uh, the difference seems to be highly correlated with the dis difference between Elvis and JEDI DTM. Which criteria should be considered if we want to exclude these footprints, or is there any method to calibrate these points instead of removing them? So yeah, um, the JEDI version one data, um, it used a very conservative approach um, for detecting signal beneath the dense canopy. So the ground elevations in Gabon, which are about you know some of the, the densest canopy that you can experience, um, are likely to be to be higher than they should be. Um, so this should get better. It should be improved in release two. Um, version one files though do contain the results from five other algorithm settings. And so one of these might um, help improve your results here. Um, in particular, I would look at algorithm five um, in Gabon, which has a much lower um, signal detection threshold than the other groups. And so it's much more sensitive to weak grounds um, in dense canopy. Um, but I, I would hope that in release two, whenever that um, is available to people, um, we have automatically um, picked the setting, uh, algorithm setting um, for each shot. And that I hope that situation will improve there. Great, thank you. So that kind of segues into the next question. What will be the difference between one and two, version one and two? I could, I could take that. I think the, the, I think there's two aspects to this answer. One's on the the data quality side, and one's from the data access side. On the data quality, the version two data will have a factor of two improvement in geolocation. So in in version one data, the geolocation accuracy at one sigma was about 20 to 25 meters. Uh, in version two, it'll be 10 to 11 meters. And so that's getting down to a resolution where we can start to link with, uh, more reliably link with other remote sensing products such as Landsat. Uh, the other improvement is what Michelle was just talking about, whereas in version one, the selected height per shot was using some very conservative algorithm settings and so we've improved our methods to select which algorithm settings are appropriate 
uh, per shot based on land cover, signal energy, and where it is in the world. Um, so we'll, prov we'll provide an estimate of which of those six estimates we think is the most applicable for that for that location. Um, from the data access perspective, um, I, I can pass it to Cole if because I think he'll be able to summarize that best. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Yeah, so from a data access perspective, like I showed in my demo, um, because uh, these JEDI data are split into suborbit granules, you're going to have smaller file sizes right off the bat. Um, but also because they contain spatial metadata uh, that allows you to see those footprints of the suborbit granules directly in the map view of Earth Data Search Client, like we demoed. Um, this will also allow you to spatially query JEDI version 2 suborbit granules directly in Earth Data Search Client. Um, so from our perspective, this will make a really nice data access workflow where you can search for JEDI version 2 data for your region of interest or do a spatial query. Then you can um, visualize the footprints that intersect your region of interest for those suborbit granules and then use those JEDI EGI subsetting services to subset the data and download just the specific data that you're interested in. So you don't have to download the source data granules. Um, and then I'd also just add to, there's a few new data sets, including um, an SRTM digital elevation model data set and a couple of new land cover data sets that should help you in identifying um, like water persistence, um, data related to leaf on and off, and uh, urban proportion as well. And then again, as I showed in the slide, we're also interested in adding JEDI version two and two appears. Great, thank you. So the next question, number five, can JEDI data be compared and or clubbed with flux tower measurements to compare GPP, NEE, et cetera, for carbon sequestration studies? Can you provide some references? Um. Uh, the short answer is is yes. Um, JEDI does provide very useful measurements for parameterization of carbon flux and other ecosystem process models, specifically height, effective LAI or PAI as we call it in the level 2B product and in the near future above ground biomass. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but, but I do know like direct comparison of measurements can be complicated by differences in the JEDI and flux footprint size. We do have a new competed JEDI science team that are looking at linking JEDI measurements into such models. And um, yeah, in the in the material that emerges from this panel, we can we can follow up with some references there. But I do encourage people to look at the JEDI website where we list all the latest references from the science team and collaborators. Super. Okay, next question. Number six, since the canopy height and biomass products from JEDI are not available yet, can one download the raw data and do processing to extract canopy height and biomass? Uh, yeah, the, well, the canopy height products are actually available now in, in the level 2A and the level 2B product files. Um, so you can download those and um, get um, information straight away. Uh, the biomass data files are expected to be released in the very ne near future through um, Oak Ridge DAC. Um, the level 1B data files though, they do contain enough information in there to be enable you to run or develop your own waveform interpretation algorithms and then um, extract the relevant geolocation information if that is of interest to you. Okay. The next question, number seven, are granules the same as the tiles, like in MODIS data? Uh, the short answer there is no. So uh, JEDI data are provided as SWAT data. Um, in version one, a single JEDI granule includes one entire ISS orbit, um, whose footprint is roughly 4.2 kilometers in the across track direction. Uh, but then with version two, since JEDI is being split into suborbit granules, each uh, granule will be roughly one quarter of an ISS orbit. Um, and then I think it's also important too to think of JEDI L1 and L2 data as really as vector data, not raster data. Um, however, as Michelle kind of mentioned too, there are the level three and level four JEDI products um, coming in the near future to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory DAC. Um, and those will be gridded raster products, which will be much more similar to MODIS data. 
Okay, great. So question eight, it now focused on at the atmosphere. Can JEDI be used to estimate smoke plume heights from fires or aerosol concentrations in urban areas? Uh, I think I think the best answer for that is that JEDI is not designed to do that. JEDI is designed for uh, highly accurate measurements of the forest canopy and terrain surface. Uh, you will find cloud signal and possibly other um, atmospheric signals affecting the transmittance of the JEDI signal. Um, but I, but it it's not an area of it's it's not an area where I'm. I'm aware that people have, have acquired any reliable results. Okay, thanks. The next question, number nine, is it possible to select only specific metrics to download? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I showed those JEDI EGI subsetting services in Earth Data Search Client, if you just wanted RH98, you could um, perform your band or layer subsetting and just select uh, the RH98. Uh, data layer and then go ahead and submit that request and it will just return that layer. Great. Question number 10. Are there plans to allow data access through a GUI? If so, can you give uh, info on when it's likely to be ready and where? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I showed um, on that PowerPoint slide, uh, we're working on integrating JEDI version 2 data into a peers or the application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples. You can see the links provided uh, here in the document. Um, I do not have a definitive timeline on when those data will be available in appears, but we are actively working on that. Um, and then again, that demo of the JEDI EGI subsetting services in NASA's Earth Data Search Client would also be a GUI based route that you could go um, and use today. Um, and then again, it will be really well suited for once those JEDI version two data are released. Okay, good. Uh, question 11, do we need to join spatial data with non-spatial data? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure that I'm understanding um, this question correctly, but hopefully this will help answer part of that question. So because JEDI data are stored in the HDF5 file format, um, that single HDF5 file will encompass all of the spatial and non-spatial data for JEDI within a single file. So spatial, like, you know, relating to the actual shots um, and the values um, and the metrics that are being calculated and generated, and then non-spatial things like metadata, that's all included in the same file. Okay. Question 12, how are researchers using JEDI data for climate change studies? Uh, in many ways, I guess, uh, I think this is a very active area of research at the moment by about many people. Key scientific motivations for JEDI is to provide quantitative, globally consistent and transparent assessment of the spatial distribution of carbon stocks in the world's forests. Um, as spatial re resolutions relevant to MRV, so monitoring, reporting and verification, um, JEDI has been used to develop demonstrative products, so combining with Landsat time series uh, to look at carbon stock change and how that might have been influenced by climate in the past, and also for parameterization of ecosystem process models to understand how changes in vegetation uh, and changes in climate will, will eventuate under different land use change scenarios. Um, so a lot of this background material on the scientific objectives of JEDI is on the website, uh, jedi.umd.edu, and I would suggest going there to get background information and the latest references. Okay, good. Question number 13, where is it possible to obtain the metadata? Yeah, so granule level metadata is going to be stored directly in that HDF5 file. And then each uh, HDF5 file also does include a .met XML file with um, certain information in it. Uh, for the collection level information, definitely check out the DOI landing pages. Um, I posted an example here, and we're working on the DOI landing pages for the version 2 data, too, so that once those data are publicly available, we'll have those ready as well. Um, otherwise, you can use uh, collection-level metadata 
which can be found through uh, NASA's Earth Data Search Client or using NASA's Common Metadata Repository um, or CMR. Okay, next question. How is the be or what is the best algorithm for detecting ground selected? Is it possible to test it to your specific study site? Yeah, so we've used airborne um, LIDAR datasets uh, from Elvis and commercial airborne LIDAR systems to develop our approach for selecting the best algorithm setting for each footprint. And it's based on the um, region, um, the plant functional type, and the laser return energy for the particular um, laser shot. So if there's coincident airborne data available for your site of interest, uh, you can verify or fine tune the selection. And remember that all of the algorithm setting results are available for each laser shot to help you do that. Okay, next question. Um, are there gaps in JEDI data for sloped areas or mountainous regions? Yeah, I can take this and then um, John and Michelle can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, I don't think there should be any gaps for JEDI data over high relief or mountainous terrain. Um, but just make sure to definitely use the quality flags to assure that you're only using the high quality returns or high quality shots um, over those regions. Yes, uh, I I would agree with that. And just be mindful the uncertainty of the high estimates will increase uh, over steep slopes. But there shouldn't be any gaps in the data in those locations, like Co, like Cole said. Apart from cloud, but everywhere has that issue. So. Okay. Question 16. Does JEDI and the DM use the same geo or datum? Is it possible to use a DM with a different datum and then the JEDI data does not line up? Yeah, so the, the DM data in the JEDI data files, so that's the uh, Tandem X and the uh, NASA DM, they have been adjusted to use the same reference frame as JEDI and that is the WGS84 ellipsoidal reference frame. But if you're using an external DEM, then you should translate it to be WGS84. Otherwise, you might end up with both vertical and horizontal offsets in your comparisons. All right. Would JEDI be useful for crops, canopy, or would it be more useful for larger vegetation like trees? So JEDI is designed for and more useful for woody vegetation. So as the question says, larger vegetation like trees. Uh, one property of the JEDI measurement is the, is the pulse width, and this can make it difficult to separate ground and canopy responses for very short stature vegetation or sort of non-woody vegetation like crops. Um, so yeah, I mean, the short answer is uh, no, it's, it, it is less useful for crops than it than it is for trees. Okay. Uh, could you comment on the global forest canopy height, which is an extrapolation of Jedi with Landsat to create a continuous canopy height model? I can. Um, that was led by the uh, GLAD team at the University of Maryland, Matt Hansen and Peter Potapov. Uh, I think it's the one of the, the first, if not the first, demonstration of combining JEDI with wall-to-wall -wall imaging data from Landsat for mapping of canopy height. It does have limitations. Um, it saturates above about 30 meter height, about 30 30 meters height, um, and it's based on version one data. So some of the limitations of version one data, such as suboptimal algorithm setting, group selection, and poor geolocation have also impacted that product as well. But it's, it was the first demonstration of linking JEDI with Landsat for wall-to-wall -wall mapping. Okay. Can you elaborate on how JEDI data can be used in post-disaster damage assessment? Uh, I can give one example. Um, the JEDI 
is often considered just a sort of snapshot in time. It's collecting data for a, prime, a, a mission length of two years. That's the prime mission, but now it'll be three to four years with the mission extension. But even within that short temporal window, there's significant uh, disasters or disturbances such as the, um, the Australian fires in early 2020. And so having measurements pre and post fire can help us assess the carbon stock change, for example and the carbon that was lost due to, due to, due to that event. Um, other changes that occur, such as um, potentially topographic changes, um, there's also potential there to assess those. All right. Uh, does the Python script have to be in the same directory with the downloaded JEDI data? Uh, no, it does not need to be in the same directory uh, as the downloaded JEDI data. You can use that dash dir argument to point to the directory containing the JEDI data that you downloaded. Okay. Next question. Are the ISAT2 data and the JEDI tree height data comparable? Uh, so again, um, JEDI is designed for the measurement of tree height. ISAT2 was not, but they are producing uh, vegetation height products. Um, in some, ISAT2 and JEDI have fundamentally different measurement techniques. So ISAT2 is a photon counting LIDAR, whereas JEDI is a full waveform LIDAR. And so often in really dense canopies, you might see that ISAT2 has more difficulty than JEDI in seeing through to the ground and getting reliable estimates of height. Um, but in other ecosystems, the measurements may, the estimates may be more comparable. Um, it is an active area of research, understanding how different they are and what, what the magnitude of difference is over different land cover types. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would stay, stay tuned. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, we'd say that, you know, you have to remember that they're making very different, um, they're measuring the surface in very different ways. And um, so you have to be careful when you're doing that comparison that you um, are cognizant of how each sensor is um, sensing the surface and make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Great. All right, the next one, can JEDI be used to create above ground biomass carbon maps? Uh, it certainly can. I mean, this is actually one of the, uh, the primary scientific ob objective of JEDI to quantify the carbon stocks of the Earth's forests. Um, we'll be releasing the first, the JEDI L4A product is footprint level estimates of above ground biomass, and the JEDI level 4B product is a one kilometer gridded estimates of above ground bias, biomass, and also the uncertainty of that estimate. Uh, these will be released through Oak Ridge DAC in in the near future, the next couple of months. Great, looking forward to those data sets. All right, the next question, how do you find the accuracy of JEDI derived forest canopy height on the ground? Uh, so we, we do that by um, comparing to our existing airborne uh, laser data sets. So that, that's from the Elvis sensor and from um, uh, John has a very extensive um, collection of commercial um, ALS data, and that has provided us with the ability to calval our measurements over a wide variety of um, terrain and um, biome types, and um, this is it's ongoing. Okay. But there's, I, will, I will add there's sort of two key steps we need. Before we can compare the heights, yeah, we need to co-locate JEDI with the reference data. So we need to account for the geolocation error. And after we've done that, we can we can sort of compare the estimates of height that result from the waveform processing. Um, there is open source software to to do some of these steps, which um, we can provide links to offline. Okay, great. Maybe we can also include them here on the document when we uh, publish it. All right, the next question. Can we access the JEDI data in Google Earth Engine? And if not, is there a plan to ingest it? 
Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, John. No, sorry. Uh, I, I might let you, I, I might let you answer first, Colin, and follow up. So just so I yeah. Don't... Yeah, so from a DAC perspective, um, I'm unsure if those data are in Google Earth Engine. I think there may be a derived uh, JEDI data set in Google Earth Engine. Maybe John knows more about that. Um, but I do not know if Google plans to ingest uh, those data. So, Sean, there, it's not the complete data set, as you would find at LP DAC, but the release one data has been added to Google Earth Engine as a Google asset. Uh, Sean Healy has published a paper in Remote Sensing describing that data set. Uh, it, it, I haven't used it myself, but I know it is available uh, there. And so, yeah, we can provide more details in the document that, that is made available after this webinar. Great, thanks. All right, the next question. I was wondering, have any, are there any accuracy assessments or have there been any accuracy assessments performed in mountainous regions for JEDI, such as the Himalaya, Himalayan region? So uh, with, with JEDI data are, are compared with airborne LIDAR data over regions where we have um, the, the data sets coexisting. Um, it doesn't include the Himalayas at this time though. Okay, um, next question. I have different tree species location data and I want to find their canopy height. Is it possible to use the JEDI data set with the location data of tree species to find their height and canopy height parameters? Uh, which question was this again, Erica? Uh, yeah, apologies, 26. question 26. Uh, it is, I mean, as I think Michelle has described this before, it is possible to co-locate JEDI data with airborne LIDAR data if it's available. If you have individual tree species, um, it, it depends on the nature of that location data. If it's individual trees, then it's going to depend on the accuracy of that location. But also linking individual trees to a JEDI footprint, which at 25 meter resolution can uh, can be complicated. Um, so, I mean, the answer is yes, but there's lots of ifs and buts, and um, uh, you need to be cognizant of the geolocation area in JEDI, the footprint size of JEDI, and the properties of your field data that you're trying to link to JEDI. Okay. The next question, 27, are the clouds considered in the quality flag? Yes, those are considered among um, other quality considerations. Okay, so how would you find the uh, the flag that is indicative of clouds? Is it a specific flag for clouds? It's um, clouds are filter out using a, a simple elevation cut by comparison with DEMs and also mean sea surface elevation. Uh, and I think it's called the land surface flag. Um, but it also forms part of the other quality flags, as, as Cole mentioned. Um, okay, yeah. If you if you look for the quality flag, that should remove um, the majority of the clouds that are in there, as well as other shots that don't meet our um, quality uh, cr criteria for, say, penetrating through properly to the ground. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Question 28, what is the exact size of the JEDI footprint? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, nominally, we say the footprint is 25 meters diameter, but in reality, the JEDI footprint or the JEDI wavefront is a Gaussian shape. And so, the Gaussian is often defined by its standard deviation or sigma, and that's one sigma is 5.5 meters, and two sigma is 22 meters diameter. And that's that two sigma is sort of the diameter at which 95% of the energy is within. 
Okay. Next question. Can we use version one data in a peers? Uh, no, those data are not available in a peers. So just the version two will be available in a peers. Yep, that's what we're working on. Great. Question 30. The temporal resolution is dependent on the ISS, but what is the usual revisit time? Sorry, what was that question again? Uh, that would be question 30. The ISS, uh, the temporal resolution is dependent on the ISS, but what is the usual revisit time? Yeah, I would say that I really can't give a good answer to that. I wouldn't say there is a usual revisit time. Um, you know, there's certain areas that will never be sampled. There's certain areas that will be sampled, you know, maybe once, and then certain areas that will be sampled many times over the lifetime of JEDI. Um, I do know, you know, because of the orbit of the ISS, as you approach uh, around 50 degrees north or south latitude, you do see a higher density of observations just because of, of the orbit of the ISS. Um, but other than that, um, I suppose you could say it would be, you know, decreasing um, chance of having observations as you um, go towards the equator. Okay. The next question, what are the expected spatial temporal resolutions for the L3L4 products? And how often do you expect one or more beams to sample each pixel? Um, well, the spatial resolution of the level three and level four gridded products are one kilometer. Um, the products that are being released um, for Oak Ridge Stack in the near future will uh, represent a, a single temporal epoch. So all the data acquired um, in the first 12 months of science data collection. Um, the second part of the question, how often do you expect one or more beams to sample each pixel? Uh, well, it obviously depends on, on um, cloud cover. I think as we get further and further into the mission and uh, on orbit longer and longer, uh, we will get better geographic coverage on that one kilometer Jedi grid. Um, we do have an aim to get at least two tracks, two Jedi tracks per one kilometer self estimation of IMS at the level in the level four products. But there will be, because of gaps in coverage, um, there, there will be some cells that don't have, have any coverage. Um, okay. Next question, 32. How do you generate grid products from JEDI footprint metrics? Uh, so our, uh, our preliminary or initial release one gridded products um, for the ground elevation and canopy height or RH100 metrics. Um, in release one, these are simply the, the mean and the standard deviation values over a one kilometer cell. Um, we're planning on applying some more sophisticated approaches for our subsequent data releases, as well as expanding the gridded products that we're going to provide. Okay, great. Question 33, can we categorize different plants using JEDI? Is it possible to distinguish different vegetation class types, such as orchards from olives or forests? And can the uh, version one JEDI data be used for classifying different vegetation structures? Well, in, in principle, I, I think yes. So different different vegetation types will have different heights and different vertical structure as represented in the JEDI level two uh, A RH metrics and level two B vertical canopy profiles. Um, how well they differentiate different vegetation types, I think that's, I think we're interested to hear that ourselves from different users and uh, different applications of the JEDI data. But the answer is yes. Um, that would be, that is a separating different structural vegetation types is one anticipated application of JEDI data. Okay, great. 
Uh, number 34, can we bulk download JEDI data over an ROI using a shape file rather than a bounding box? Yeah, that's a great question. So the workflow that I showed in Earth Data Search Client for bulk downloading um, version two data, you can also use an ROI instead of a bounding box. Um, and I think in Earth Data Search Client, you can actually just drag and drop a shape file or a GeoJSON directly into Earth Data Search Client. And then when you get to the EGI subsetting services, um, it will allow you to subset to that specific region of interest, whether that's a watershed boundary or a country border, that sort of thing. Um, but again, you'll have to wait until the JEDI version 2 data are publicly available. All right. Uh, how do we filter JEDI data for day and night? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so you can use the solar elevation data sets and filter any shots with values less than zero, meaning that the shot was acquired at night. And then again, positive values would mean that it was a daytime observation. And I did want to plug to, I put a link to the JEDI L2 user guide. Um, you know, questions like this and like the, the cloud filtering, um, there's some really good explanation in the L2, or yeah, the level two user guide about the interpretation of quality information from JEDI as well. So definitely check that out. All right, so the next question, do we need to combine the level 1A data with level 2A, level 2B to generate tree height? Question 36. Uh, well, we, we've done that for you. Um, if you look in the level 2A and the B data, you will see in there that um, there are already estimates for a tree height. It's called the RH metrics. Um, so we've gone in there and we've applied um, some waveform algorithms um, to extract out those, those particular um, measurements for you. Um, but if you're interested in, in developing algorithms um, of your own to do this or um, developing new products, then the level 1B data set contains a geolocated laser retained waveform and it should have all the information that you need to do that. Um, but we have given you a um, an initial cut of those um, height and topography products in the level two already. All right, nice. Um, 37, does it make more sense to think of the five meter height variables as integrations over an elevation range, say from, ex for example, from 10 meters to 15 meters above ground, or as very thin cross sections? Um, I, can, I can certainly try and answer this. Uh, the, the vertical profiles of cover and PAI are sort of cumulative profiles. And so they do represent an integration over a height range, such as topper canopy, uh, zero to five meters or zero to 10 meters. Um, the plant area volume density profiles uh, are in units of meter squared over meter cubed. And so they do represent um, discrete vertical bins and the area of plant material within those bins. Um, I think that's the answer to the question, but, um, but yes. Okay, good, thanks. All right, so what is the vertical accuracy of JEDI? Number 38. It's the million dollar question. Um, so uh, the vertical accuracy is, is dependent on um, several things and primarily at this point, with our release one and release two, the main driver on that is the horizontal accuracy. Um, release one, that was in the 20 meter range. For release two, that has improved to um, be um, about 10 meters. Um, so that means that it makes it easier to determine what that vertical accuracy um, is truly is. Um, and so with release two, by comparison to sort of our airborne Elvis and ALS data set, um, for ground measurements, uh, we're about in the three meter um, uh, uh, one sigma range um, and similar for the RH uh, 98 values. Uh, John, you might want to add to that. Uh, yeah, and no, I think that was a good summary, Michelle. 
Um, I think as the waveform process is improved, we expect that to improve considerably. All right. The next question, uh, number 38. Is JEDI suitable for reed vegetation studies? Would JEDI be useful for monitoring vegetation loss and rangeland and transhuman co corridors? Um, I think this will have a similar answer to one of the earlier questions. Um, so sort of read vegetation is my understanding it's very short statured so it'll be very diff it can be very difficult to separate the canopy and ground signals in those environments um jedi in rangeland environments so typically grasslands that can be it'll have the same issue so separating uh changes in 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 non-woody canopies uh, will be difficult, um, very difficult. Uh, but th those rangeland environments also include trees and shrubs, and you know there is potential to use Jedi measurements to to look at changes in those in that component of the those ecosystems. Okay. So I guess the added complexity here with reed is that it is a vegetation that is primarily but not necessarily found in water so one mm -hmm. of the characteristics is there might be a water underneath yeah okay so yeah inundation inundation from water like 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 we answered with the mangrove question earlier will it will impact the estimation of canopy height um and so you'll need to consider that inundation signal in any analyses and estimates of change Okay, so the next question, uh, can we use JEDI data for bathymetry? Question 39, any examples of erosion monitoring in estuaries? I think the short answer to that is no. Um, one micron data doesn't penetrate um, through water. Okay. Question 41, which data level or attributes would you recommend to derive a measure of ecosystem complexity? Um, it depends how you want to define ecosystem complexity, but I think the vertical profiles, the vertical canopy profiles and the level 2B product would be quite useful um, for de defining the vertical complexity of vegetation. There is actually a data set in there called foliage height diversity, which is a descriptor of the vertical complexity. But more generally, the, the plant area volume density profiles or canopy cover profiles and the level two product um, will, be, will be useful for that application. Okay. The next question is the lifetime of uh, Jedi on the ISS related to upgrades to the equipment, e.g. tunable lasers? Um, I will say that, I mean, the, the mission life of Jedi is designed to answer the science questions. So how long we need on orbit to um, acquire sufficient measurements to meet our science requirements. Um, the, also, the lifetime of, of experiments such as JEDI on the International Space Station do have a finite life. We are in a slot on the GEM on the ISS, and there will be follow-on missions that use that slot. Uh, but we have applied for a JEDI mission extension, and that should see the JEDI life continue until hopefully 2023. Right. Um, yeah, there's uh, in terms of the the actual instrument itself. There's nothing life limiting um, um, as part of the engineering. Okay, good. Question forty three: Can the lidar above ground biomass model developed from airborne lidar be applied to Jedi directly? Uh, we have we have trained the Jedi 
above ground biomass models on simulated Jedi waveforms. Those simulated Jedi waveforms are derived from airborne LIDAR models. Um, many of the metrics that are used to predict biomass from LIDAR are what we call LIDAR perceived, as in the same metric may be different between ALS and Jedi simply because of properties of the, of the LIDAR measurements. Uh, that would lead to differences in the in the biomass predictions. And so if you just have a model based on top canopy height, um, under some circumstances, that model may be transferable. Um, but if you have a model that's more complicated, such as based on canopy height and cover or, or particular combinations of relative height metrics, then it's unlikely the model will be directly transferable. You would need to account for those differences. All right, and then the last question, and maybe um, actually there was another one rel related to the last one. I'll bunch them together. So what is the geolocation accuracy of JEDI and is there a way to correct any geolocation errors with the current version? Um, so I, I guess I can answer this. Uh, the version two, the geolocation accuracy of the version one data at one sigma, mean one sigma was 20 to 25 meters. In version two, it will be 10 to 11 meters. Um, that geolocation error does have a systematic and random component. If you have airborne LIDAR such as Elvis or commercial level or LIDAR covering a large enough area, it is possible to co-locate those data and account for the systematic error component. Um, but yeah, you need airborne LIDAR data sets to do that. Right, okay. And all right, one last question that we, we got. Uh, as given that JEDI works in the 1064 nanometer and ISAT 2 532 nanometer, is there an advantage of JEDI as far as forest studies are concerned? I, Sorry, what's I the think yeah, so. Uh, so, what is the advantage for JEDI um, to do forest studies as opposed to ISAT 2? Um, well, look, Jedi was. <laughs> well, I can start Sorry. it. I was to say Jedi was specifically. Yeah. Jedi was specifically designed um, to measure vegetation height, so we sized our footprint size to um, be, you know, 25 meters wide, um, to match the size of the canopy, so that we're able to penetrate through, um, um, to the ground um, for every footprint, um, and so then that means that then we can measure canopy height from every footprint. Um, so. That is our primary measurement, and um, so yeah, we designed everything to be able to do that. Okay, and great. Mm -hmm. And 1064 nanometers of Jedi is for you know canopy foliage is has much higher reflectance than at 532 nanometers, which I set to operate at. Great. All right, so with that, um, we'll, we'll close this session. Uh, we will be posting this document online. Um, thank you to our uh, guest uh, speaker, to Cole Creeble and to uh, Michelle and to John. And thank you to all of you for tuning in today. Remember that we have two more sessions left in this series. The next one, the next two will be focused on solar induced fluorescence. So the next one will be next Tuesday, and that will cover the fundamentals of SIF. And that will be by Professor Christian Frankenberg from the California Institute of Technology. And then the last session will be a demo on SIF. So that would be next Thursday. And uh, members of the OCO2 team will discuss how to access SIF data from OCO2 and how to analyze that data. So 
stay tuned and um, thank you everyone. And uh, we'll tune in again next Tuesday. Have a great day.